PlayStation 5 vs Xbox Series X. Spoiler alert, they are both very similar, but I guess it is for different people. Now, when it comes to the specs of these two devices, they are actually pretty similar with the PS5 being slightly underpowered, but not by much. They are both equipped with the AMD Zen 2 CPU, so it's not the 5000 series, it's actually the 3000 series that is specifically made just for the consoles. They are also equipped with the RDNA 2 GPUs from AMD, but I'm not too sure what are the equivalents in the real world because right now the lowest equivalent I can think of is actually the RX 6800 but I think that is slightly more powerful than what these two consoles have. Both of the consoles are equipped with 16GB of GDDR6 RAM. Now when it comes to real world use, the PS5 only has about 650 to 700 gigabytes worth of space that you can use while the Xbox Series X has about 800 gigabytes of space. Now with all that little specs out of the way, the price for both these consoles are very similar. They are both priced at 499 USD. So the PS5 has a digital only version that costs 399 US dollars. So you pretty much save $100 less if you do not need a disk drive on your PlayStation 5. While the Xbox Series X actually has a gimped down version of the console, which is the Series S, that is priced at 299 US dollars, which can only do 1440p, but it is actually quite a good buy if you do not have a 4K monitor or a TV. When we are talking about the UI of both of these consoles, which is the user interface, the PS5 is actually very similar to the PlayStation 4. So if you are someone that is very used to the PlayStation 4's UI, the PlayStation 5 will feel very right at home. I personally have no complaints about the UI of the PlayStation 5. It feels very familiar because it's so similar to the PlayStation 4. And some of the new functions of the UI actually helps the casual gamer to get achievements, you know, all those trophies that you pretty much want to get and will never do in your lifetime because you don't know how to get them. The PlayStation 5 actually has a UI that shows you what you can do to get some of those trophies and achievements. While the Xbox Series X if you are very familiar with the Windows UI, so let's say you click the start button, you see all those little boxes and stuff like that. The UI on the Xbox Series X is actually really, really similar to that. So obviously Microsoft is trying their best to integrate the Xbox into your Windows experience as well because technically they are all under the same company. If you're very familiar with the Xbox 360 and the One X, the UI will feel very, very familiar. Now, it comes to the meat of the video, the performance. Both of these consoles perform the same. I mean, yeah, the PlayStation 5 has some exclusives, but I will get into that later. But when it comes to games that are available for play on both of these consoles, the games just play exactly the same. Which brings me to some of my gripes with the performances of both of these consoles. Sure, both of these consoles can do high refresh rate gaming at this point of time, yes. If you couple both of these consoles with a very good monitor that can do 120Hz at least and also a very good connection, so that means you, if you can use your HDMI 2.1 cable, the experience is amazing because I have not had high refresh rate gaming available to me on my other consoles that I played on previously. But when you turn ray tracing on or all the shadows and whatever extra flare that these two consoles offer, that is when the performance dips right back down to 30 frames a second. But don't get me wrong, I guess if you really want to play any of those games uh, available for these consoles competitively, you wouldn't be turning on all this extra flare and shadows anyway. But it still boils down to the fact that if I want some eye candy on my TV or my monitor screen, I gotta sacrifice frame rates for it. I have no doubt that with the proper driver updates for both of these consoles, I am pretty sure games can go up to 4K 60fps with ray tracing turned on. But that quality with those frame rates is a pretty big far-fetch right now because even on the new AMD GPUs, the RX 6800 and 6800 XT, 
4K 60 FPS with ray tracing turned on is still quite a big mess on those GPUs themselves. So once that is settled, I'm pretty sure they will bring the technologies to both of these consoles and who knows, maybe in a couple of years we will see 4K 60 FPS with ray tracing turned on available on your 4K TV. It is actually not a knock on any of these consoles. It's not Sony's fault, it is not Microsoft's fault that they can't do 60 FPS on 4K. It's more of whether AMD is able to churn out drivers that can optimize these chips well enough to have that kind of experience. Now, still in terms of performance, the heat dissipation of both of these devices. Okay, so let me just, uh, I'll just ruin the set, whatever. So, for the PlayStation 5, there is actually a big giant fan over here that dissipates the heat through all the ports that are at the back here. So, let me just slowly pull this out for you guys. As you can see here, the PlayStation 5 has a big giant fan that draws air in and what it does is that it exhausts all the hot air out at the back of the console. You can see a lot of fins here if you really concentrate. And this part gets pretty warm when you play games, but it is not hot to the touch. So all you feel is just warm air coming out and it is actually not that hot in the first place. So the cooling for the PlayStation 5 is actually pretty top notch. I know there are some reviews out there that say that when they open up the PS5, there are some RAM chips inside here. They are not cooled by the heat sink inside. So far, I have not encountered any problems with my PlayStation 5. I use my PlayStation horizontal most of the time. So if anything, I would assume that this part will probably get warm and all that, but it doesn't so. I don't know if they got a dud unit or whatsoever. In general, I personally have not received any problems with my PlayStation. So now when it comes to the heat dissipation of the Xbox, let me just put all of these controls aside. I will get to the controllers soon. This thing, look at the, okay, <laughs> I mean, let's just segue into this then. Look at the size difference. This is so huge. This is so small. But for some reason, this thing is not even as hot as the PlayStation 5. Okay, maybe not as hot is the wrong term to use. It is actually equivalent when it comes to heat dissipation. The Xbox, whenever it's powered on and when I play games on it, the only part that I feel that is pretty warm is at the top of the Xbox itself and maybe somewhere around here where all the components are. The fan in the Xbox does a really good job at dissipating a lot of heat. So whenever you put your hand here, it actually feels like it's a hand warmer or something along that lines. But the console itself is not hot at all. So I guess the size of the Xbox actually doesn't really affect how it dissipates heat and I guess the console is pretty cool, no pun intended. Now the next thing I'm going to talk about are the games. So the games are quite a big divisive thing in the community because as you guys know the Xbox has the Xbox Game Pass obviously and the PlayStation 5 has a lot of exclusives going for it. So obviously for the PlayStation 5, you have exclusives like Spider-Man Miles Morales, Demon Souls. While the Xbox has the Game Pass where you can actually just pay a certain amount every month and you get 100 over games, I wouldn't say for free because you're paying it per month, but you'll get all of those games, 100 over games for just that $20 a month. So this is where I would say that it becomes very divisive because it is very clear right now that even though these two consoles perform exactly the same, they are meant for different markets. And this is just my opinion, so it's not really absolute that these two consoles are for different people, but on the PlayStation 5, it feels like the PlayStation 5 is made for the long-time PlayStation gamers. So whatever games that you have bought on the PS4 and also planning to buy on the PS5, obviously everything can be played on the PlayStation 5 itself. But if you are looking to integrate this into any kind of other things around your home, it doesn't really do that. So what I mean by integrating it into your home is that for the Xbox, if let's say you have a PC that has Xbox Game Pass, that pretty much extends to your Xbox as well. So you can play games on your Xbox and you can play it on your computer as well. 
And the Xbox Series X actually has this nifty feature where I can actually turn it on using Google Home. So I can just say, hey Google, turn my Xbox on and it will turn on. I don't know about the PlayStation 5 because I've not seen that functionality at all in all my testing and all my stuff. So like I said, the PlayStation 5 is probably meant for those that have been playing a lot of console games and if you have that legacy of PlayStation 4 games that you've bought on your old PlayStation 4, this is actually a very good buy and a very good upgrade. Now, if you're looking to integrate your console into your home and also just want a console to play something on your TV like games and stuff, the Xbox is a good buy. It perfectly syncs to your Microsoft account where you can actually buy the Game Pass and it can sync with all your computers at home as well. So I would say that the Xbox is actually a good mini PC that you can put in front of your TV just to play the games whenever you feel tired or maybe you want to just have some downtime, just go on your couch and just switch it on and you're good to go. And because it has Xbox Game Pass, you can play 100 over games on this and also if you feel like playing it on your computer, you can do it as well just for $20 a month. Now when it comes to user experience, so when I open the box, I take the console out, set it up and all that stuff, both of these consoles are very easy to set up. For the PlayStation 5, basically you just got to connect this to your TV and then sign in to your PlayStation account and that's all. And for the Xbox, it is pretty much the same because if you have a Microsoft account that you've linked to your PC or your old Xboxes, once you just sign in, you will, all the games that you have available for you to play can be downloaded into the console and you are good to go. So no complaints there, comparing the controller to the devices and stuff like that are all pretty seamless and I, I really got nothing to say, there's nothing bad to say about it. And if you're looking to expand the storage as well for these two consoles, the PlayStation 5 has a slightly more tedious way of doing it, but it is not that much tedious, it's just way more tedious than the Xbox. So for the PlayStation 5, basically you gotta open up the cover of your console. So you just take this out and then... So once you get to the part of this console, you just gotta unscrew this to take out this little protective cover. And then if you have a PCIe 4.0 SSD, you can just put it inside. But PlayStation has come up to say that there is still no functionality for the expansion slot until they release a future update. They want to test all the PCIe 4.0 NVMe drives that are in the market first to see whether they can actually match the speed of the storage inside the PS5 itself. It's basically a user experience thing. So let's say if you install an SSD drive that is not up to par with the PlayStation 5's uh, internal SSD, it will obviously load slower, a bit not much slower, but they do not want to compromise that experience. So I understand why they do not want to activate this first before actually knowing what drives that they can use to not hamper that user experience. Now on the Xbox, it is actually very, very simple. All you got to do is buy their proprietary SSD expansion and just shove it into this slot here. But like I said, it is proprietary. For the PS5, you can actually use your PCIe 4.0 drive in your computer or in something that actually requires the PCIe 4.0 drive. But this, once you buy this for the Xbox, you can't use it for anything else. So think of it like the old PlayStation memory card. But hey, all you gotta do is just shove it in and then it's expanded. But you can't use it for anything else. So that is quite a big minus point for Xbox. That's the only way to expand the storage on this little thing. Both of these come with one terabyte or even less. And Call of Duty Modern Warfare, I'm looking at you, 250 gigs of nonsense in your game. Once I install that game, I only have space for like 500 gigs of other games. Now, finally, let's talk about controller compatibility. There is a reason why the Xbox has like three controllers there and the PlayStation 5 has only one. DualSense 5. It is one of the best controllers I've ever had to experience because this controller is so ergonomic. It is so amazing. Everything feels right with this controller. The buttons feel good. The thumbsticks are amazing. The triggers slightly mushy at stock. Let me get to that. But besides that, 
it is it feels it really feels like the Xbox controller actually. Wait, let me just No! The PlayStation 5 controller feels much better. And that is a big step up for PlayStation because if you've used the DualShock controllers from 1 to 4, they are not really that ergonomic. It feels natural that the thumbsticks are over at this position. But last time when you used the DualShock 4, it just feels like I had to like, I don't know, cram my finger a certain way before I can actually use the thumbsticks really well. So I guess this, this controller, amazing. Now, when it comes to pairing it with the PS5, you can only use this to play PlayStation 5 games. If you have a PlayStation 4 game, then yes, you can use your PlayStation 4 controller to play those games. But if the new games that are out do not support PlayStation 4, it is highly unlikely that you'll be able to use your PlayStation 4 controller on the PlayStation 5. And that is quite a bummer because Despite how good the DualSense 5 is, it is actually 70 US dollars compared to the DualShock 4's 50 US dollars. So if you want to buy this in Singapore, this is 100 Singapore dollars as opposed to 65 dollars for the DualShock 4. And this is just the basic controller for the PlayStation 5. Granted, you probably won't need another controller, but let's say if you're playing fighting games and all that, if for some reason the fighting games do not support PlayStation 4 controllers, Ooh, bad time, you gotta pay a lot more than $100 to get a new controller. Now on the Xbox Series X, if you have an old Xbox controller, it just pairs up, does a firmware update and you are good to go. So the one that I have with me right now, this is my own personal one. This is the Xbox Elite controller that I got for actually my PC but it is so amazing because you can like have all these different thumb screws not thumb screws, thumb sticks, you can just take out and adjust the height and stuff and it is made for the Xbox One X but this thing just works with the Xbox Series X this is actually the Xbox Series X current controller it is not much different from the old Xbox One X controller actually maybe just the, this, the directional pad but everything else feels identically the same so on the Xbox side, if you have like old controllers from your old Xbox, all of them will work perfectly fine with the console, so you don't need to buy new ones essentially. And not only that, because of all that controller compatibility thing, you can actually buy external controllers for your Xbox Series X. So what I have with me now, right now is the Razer Wolverine V2. Uh, Razer sent this to me because they were like, oh, you're doing an Xbox review, why don't we just send this to you to just let you know that this exists but <laughs> I actually want to say something about this this is actually quite a good next gen ish controller because all the buttons are mechanical so you, I don't know if you can hear this can you? yes so they are all mechanical buttons and it's amazing and I've tried it as well it is very ergonomic and if you have something that you really like to play competitively I think this is a very good controller but the only thing that I gotta see with this controller is that, look at the wires. <laughs> I mean, it's very long, it's not wireless, but whatever. Now, speaking of wireless, this is something that I really want to highlight with the Xbox controllers. I tell you, what the hell is this? Man? It is 2020. I mean, sure, this is from the Xbox One days, maybe, I don't know, battery technology is still not up to mark, but this is the new Xbox Series X controller. Who the hell uses double A batteries for their controllers these days? All I want to do is basically after a day of playing, just plug in my controller and there we go. We can have a fully charged controller the next day. Not like play games and then the controller dies halfway because my double A battery obviously can't tell me whether the charge is fully charged or whatsoever and I don't know when it's gonna die, I'm not gonna buy like a lot of battery packs. You get what I mean? It's 2020, Microsoft. Give us our built-in battery, please. So obviously, if you want to use your controller without much hitches, you gotta obviously connect this to your console rather than having to play wirelessly. But hey, I think Microsoft also sells battery packs that you can put inside here, but it's extra cost. So, whatever. And then there's 
obviously the wired counterparts that you can use on the Xbox. So hey, so yeah, controller compatibility. You can use so many things with this. You can only use the DualSense 5 with this plus the old PS4 controllers if the game is a PS4 title and will support the PS4 controllers. So yeah, I think I covered most of the main points that I wanted to cover. Both of the consoles are pretty much the same. They perform similarly. The heat is very similar. None, is, none are hotter than the other. It's just really what you want to use it for. If you are someone who plays a lot of console games competitively or just play a lot of console games in general, get the PlayStation 5. And if you are someone who want to have a mini PC in your living room that can play the same games that you have on your computer, then I guess get the Xbox. But at this point of time of this video's recording, these two consoles are not in stock anywhere. I actually would like to implore you, if you really want to get these consoles, please wait. These consoles will probably not phase out anytime soon. They are new, they will probably remain new for the next two years. Be patient, do not buy from scalpers. If this thing is being sold at $1,000, do not buy it, no matter how desperate you are. And I can safely say right now, all the games that I've played, you are not missing out that much because on the Sony side, there are not much exclusives that are out for the PlayStation 5 itself yet. And on the Xbox side, well, just buy the Game Pass and play your games on the PC if you already have a PC and just wait for the console. And there you have it, the comparison between the PS5 and the Xbox Series X. You guys might have wanted a bloodbath, but <sighs> these two guys just seems like brothers from another mother's. I think that's, that's the only way I can put it because they both are pretty much the same thing. While we're talking about these two consoles, in the next episode of Y-Tech, just to continue with the console theme that we have this month, I am going to build a PC that actually has the specs of these consoles and see how it performs in 4K gaming and also maybe ray tracing gaming, if that is still a thing, with the new RX 6800 that AMD sent to me. Till then, stay safe and I'll see you in the next video. Yeah!